Alrighty, I think I've got everything good to go on my end. If folks could let me know in the live chat if I am both seen and heard, that would be great. Looks like things are up and running as best I can tell, but you never know. Technology can can and often does throw curveballs at us. So if you let me know if you can see and hear me okay, that would be great. Hope everyone's doing well. We'll do some shout outs here in a minute and then we'll get started at the top of the hour in about 10 minutes from now. So can folks hear me and see me okay? Sometimes there's a little, seems like there's a little bit of a lag on the on the live chat. All right, Mandy Jo, Amanda Jo says I'm good to go. Sweet. It's always good to know that you're um, coming through loud and clear before you start yapping at the microphone and then you realize you're muted or who knows what, right? Um, I'm still getting used to this team. You know what you signed up for. Well, great. It looks like folks are jumping on. We have a little over 200 so far. That's a great start. Uh, we've got Heike from Northern Germany. Uh, let's see, Tom from Southwest Ohio. Everyone seems to be in good spirits. That's great. Loud and proud in Northwest France. Excellent. Kara in the UK. K in the UK. Dan Cooper's here. Peter from Sweden. If I miss your name, I apologize. They kind of scroll at me very quickly, but I do try to get as many as I can. Rich from Houghton Lake, Michigan. Uh, let's see, there's Susie Jones. Yeah, if we can get the captions turned on, Susan. Um, let me check and see. As far as I could tell, I've enabled the captions on my end. I don't see anything obvious to me. So Susan, if there's something I need to do, let me know. A uh, quick shout out to our moderators today, Amanda Joe and Susan Helmer. Let's see, we got Rick from Florida. We have Glenn from Sunny friendly Manitoba, Canada. Good day, eh? Um, Sarah from North Wales. PK Helge from Illinois. Jennifer from South Africa, greetings. Gary from Ridgecrest. Scott from Kansas. Um, Gisley from Reykjavik, greetings. John from Toronto, Andreas from North Sweden, Terry from New Jersey, Richard, Massachusetts, Jackie from Northern Kentucky, Joyce from Hawaii, Aloha. Uh, it jumps down on me. Carrie Ann from Crystal Lake, Illinois. Tess from Sweden, Dee from Newfoundland, Lindsay from Southwest England. Ray from Disney World in Florida. Have a great kind of Disney day there. Agneta from Sweden, hello. Nicola from Newcastle, UK. Sammy's mom from Washington State, Oscar, San Diego. Uh, who else is here? All sorts of people. So many people. It's so great to have you all here. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Skagit Ed, Skagit Ed. Sorry, I got to get that right. He even put the J in there, so I would pronounce it right, and I still, I still screw it up. Skagit Ed from Burlington, Washington. Uh, it's damp in Portland, says Alice. Geo from Switzerland is here. We've got Ken from Pocatello, Idaho representing. Excellent. Uh, Bree from the streets in Las Vegas. Be safe down there. Will from Toronto. Uh, people appreciating our moderators. Thank you very much. We have amazing moderators. Looks like Lisa R is also on here from New Zealand. Who knows what insane hour it is there, but we uh, are always appreciative when she can jump on. Uh, Corinne from Tucson, Arizona. Jamie from Norfolk, Virginia. Janet from West Texas. My friend Elaine Jones I saw was on there earlier from Tucson. Sarah from Ontario. Tamar from Netherlands. Richard from Ch Chelmsford. Michelle just says good morning. Good morning, Michelle. Claire from Ontario, Canada. Zeke from Central New Jersey. Lorraine from Kingston, Ontario. Zoe from Australia. Uh, Silas Banjo from Cornwall. Tori from Kentucky. Christina from Ontario, Mrs. M from Texas, but she says Ohio, so maybe she was originally from Texas. Who knows what the backstory is there. Thomas from Haines, Alaska, greetings. Uh, then it just skipped on me, doggone it. Oh boy, I'm like way behind now. 
I try to go at my pace, but they scroll so much faster. Uh, Adventure Sombrada from Waikale, Hawaii. Aloha. Um, Reno, Nevada. Natalie from Texas. M Mia from Finland. Jesse Les Paul from Austin. Sarah from Cornwall. Northern Lad from the UK. Halpin from Arizona. Magnus from Spokane. Nobody try, wants to try to pronounce Olaf. Yo, Scott, I'm right by you in... Okay, that wasn't even for me. I just read one. Sorry. Sophie from the Netherlands near Amsterdam. Yeah, everyone give it a thumbs up. That's always good. Uh, it helps promote our geology education, get the word out. Always good things happen when, when we like and share and do those sorts of things. Uh, CD from Colorado. Alan from Castine, Maine. Lore from Nova Scotia. If I butcher your name or your location, I apologize. Cat67 from the Isle of Man in UK. Matteo from Italy. Soke Cat from Arizona. Kevin from Black Diamond, Washington. Uh, Vicky, thanks for your donation. Dan from Dallas, Texas. Catman Koo from Lodgepole, Alberta. Linda from New Hampshire, the White Mountains, beautiful area. Bob from Ottawa. Andrea from Switzerland. Weather Kids from Oklahoma. Petro Guru from Boulder, Colorado. I wish I could go back in time and change my little YouTube handle. I guess you could probably still do that, although maybe it's too late because I've kind of established just my given name. But I might have come up with something cooler if, you know, back in 2013 when I joined YouTube. But such as it is. Roberta from Long Island. David from Idaho Falls. David from Davisburg, Michigan. Two Davids in a row. Pretty cool. Quake Cat Utah from Michigan, uh, Brian Bailey from UK Somerset, Randy from Minnesota, Maryland from Northern New York, and Elaine, I saw you Elaine, but there you are again, uh, Julie from Scotland, Cynthia from Troy, John from Western Australia, CCN from the Great Columbia Basin in Washington, Scablands Rock, yeah, you guys do a pretty cool geology, I'll give you that. Wayne says howdy. John says hi from the UK of Southampton. Vivid Magic from Eidenhoven, the Netherlands. Sue from the UK. Sue from Maine. Two Sues in a row. We had two Davids in a row, two Sues in a row. Pretty cool. Uh, Nuggethead is here on their birthday in California. Happy birthday. Thanks for joining us. That's great. Uh, we have someone from the Ukraine. Welcome. Hope you're well. Uh, Winnipeg, Davidson, Michigan. Brian from New Hampshire. I won't get to all of these friends, sorry. Uh, Shashina from Southern Oregon. I got two minutes to squeeze in a few more. Joseph from Austria. Robert from Norway. Helena from Portugal. Uh, Minnesota sailing on a summer breeze. Uh, Hans from the Deutschland. Amelia from South Africa. Rhonda from South Carolina. Uh, Mickey from Yorkshire, England. Peggy, Alabama. Robin from England. Tomer from Israel. Greetings. Um, M. Meath from upstate New York, KC, happy Saturday, David from Post Falls, Idaho, and all sorts of folks here. Oh, wait, I got time for a few more. Let's go. I feel like it's beat the clock or something, you know, like I can do this. Uh, Marsha from Niceville, Florida. Is there really a town in Florida named Niceville? I guess there is. I don't know where that is, but that's, that's pretty awesome. If you say you're from Niceville, like what could go wrong there, right? Uh, Monet from Bavaria, Jellybean from West Norfolk, UK, Creamers from Northern California, Aya Sonner from the Driftless area of Southwest Wisconsin, Barbara from North Idaho, Jeffrey from Seattle, Joanne, who made me an awesome hat, from Chesapeake, Virginia. Thank you, Joanne. It's been too warm to wear it lately, but, you know, next winter for sure. Kaz from Sydney. Uh, oh, I just skipped ahead, darn it. Nina from London. A Jaded Lady from West Virginia, Meredith from Washington, Alb from Scotland, Vero from France Park, uh, and on and on and on. Erica from Western Virginia. So many good folks. It's so cool to see we've just organically built this community of folks who like to learn geology um, and can tolerate being with me. Maybe that's the bigger thing. Awesome. Janet Clancy, glad you're here. Frank from Torrance, California. And Melissa from Central Pennsylvania. That'll round it out because 
according to my clocks, friend, it is 10 o'clock here, Mountain Standard Time. So greetings and welcome to this live stream broadcast. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me today. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming aboard here to hear what I have to say, to also share in our learning of not just things happening in Iceland, but sometimes we delve into other topics as well. So I do appreciate all that you do to help support the channel. It means a lot to me. I uh, want to give a special shout out to our moderators, Lisa R., uh, Amanda Joe, who goes by Mandy Joe on the live chat, and also Susan Helmer. They do the heavy lifting. They are the MVPs. So please treat them well. Please uh, follow their direction on submitting questions and such and we'll have a great productive session together uh we'll probably keep this to at most maybe two hours uh, i played some volleyball this morning so that was great and it is a beautiful day here in southern idaho the sun is out it is not windy uh, and the temperatures look great so i'm going to get outside this afternoon and do a little rock climbing with some friends so but i want to make sure we have time to do this live stream together and spend some time looking at some of the things happening in Iceland along with a few announcements and such. So again, welcome, thanks for joining the team and hope you're well. Let's go ahead, here's our little outline of what we'll do today. I have a few announcements of things upcoming on the channel and some other things happening, field trips and such that I wanna make. And then we'll spend the, uh, the first half of our time going over some of the latest data from Iceland. I think most of you know at this point, we're all you know, waiting um, possibly with bated breath for the next eruptive event, if not an, an eruptive event, then some sort of subsurface magma movement or intrusion. Uh, we saw that last Saturday and here we are a week later. Uh, so it seems like something should happen very soon, uh, but it still could take a couple of days. We'll just have to see. And then we'll round, up, uh, round out our session today with some questions from you. I'll try to get to as many as I can, but we may be limited on time. So just realize that there's um, always more questions than we actually have time to answer. So, okay, let's get going here. So the first little batch of announcements I have here are my field trips. Um, I've had great response from these. I guess the biggest update here is that the three days of field trips in June, that, that has actually filled. Uh, I tried to keep each day's field trip around 25 to pushing maybe 30 participants. I, I feel like if I go beyond that, uh, then it might be logistically a little bit trickier and maybe the quality drops a little bit. At some point you can just have too many people to facilitate an effective field trip. So I'm hoping I picked a good sweet spot in terms of getting as many people as I can, um, but still having a, a good field trip experience. But not to worry, what I'll probably do, especially with the, these three locations, which seem to be quite popular, or perhaps it's the dates that are, that's more popular, but I will try to plug in this field trip at a future date, possibly um, maybe later in the summer, but more likely early fall. Uh, if you know anything about Southern Idaho weather, by July, it's, it's kind of hot everywhere. Maybe not the most awesome time to be outside staring at an outcrop or a road cut at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, some of you might be psyched on that. I'm always psyched on that, um, but I'm guessing a lot of people would you know, rather be sitting in the shade or in the air conditioned space somewhere. So, so I will put out some other dates moving forward. I just haven't worked out my calendar enough to, to figure those out. I will start back up at the college here in mid to late August. So I'll have to figure out uh, exactly like probably a weekend window, like a, a, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday that works, uh, maybe late September, something like that. So look for that. But I do still have space on the April trip. So there's two dates in April. This is a repeat of the field trips I did last October, which were very successful. And here's a photo of some of those folks at one of our first outcrops on the second day. And so I do still have, those are about half full, I'd say. So there's about room for 10 to maybe 12 people on each of those dates. So if you're interested, you can shoot me an email. Moving forward, uh, Amanda, Joe, and I are working on some ways to make the field trip information and sign up process a little more streamlined. So you don't have to email me and so you can just find the information, sign up, uh, you know, on a website or something. I'll talk more about that here in a minute, but but that's where we're at so far, at least for field trips in the short term. So um, that's where that's at. 
The other fun thing I've, I've worked on is many of you saw the the two interviews I've done in the last few weeks. I did an interview with uh, Professor Thorderson uh, maybe two or so weeks ago, and that went really well. That was my first real interview with someone in this type of format. And then maybe a few weeks ago, I was I had Nick Zentner on. Was it last week? Well, I guess it was last Sunday, wasn't it? Yeah, so last Sunday the 3rd, um, I had Nick Zentner on my channel as a guest. And that went, I thought that went really well. I think I've heard a lot of good things about that. So what I've done to try to continue that type of content is reached out to a few folks I know that I think have interesting stories to tell that I think you folks would find um of interest. And so Ariana Soldati, um, I actually met her at the place you see behind her there. I went out to the eruption in August of 2022 and I was, you know, down by the edge of the lava flow and it was mostly tourists that were kind of sitting back and I was getting ready to take a sample and all the tourists were kind of looking at me like, is this guy crazy or is he a geologist? Because it's got to be one of the two. And sort of nearby me was this other person that looked like they knew what they were doing and they looked like they were doing essentially the same thing. And it was this fine lady here, Ariana. And so we talked a little bit. Um, she ended up helping me film my little lava collection video um, and we've stayed in touch a little bit. So she's an amazing and enthusiastic volcanologist and educator. She's passionate about public outreach. And so I thought we would do an interview with her, find out more about her story, her background, what she does with her research on volcanoes, because she was out there in Iceland uh, doing research. And so look for that. I'm actually going to do her interview this next Friday on the 15th, but it'll just be a recorded interview. So you might see it later that day or possibly the next day on the 16th. So that's something to look forward to, but that's in the pipeline for sure. Uh, and then another interview I have coming up, and I know a lot of you are looking forward to this. Um, there is another YouTube channel that many of you are familiar with called Just Icelandic. And it is content put together by this gentleman, Gilfi Gilfason. And he is a native Icelander. He worked in Grindavik for a time in the fish industry. And he is also an exceptional videographer and photographer. And he puts together all sorts of great uh, drone images with his his very fun kind of dry commentary on his YouTube channel. So I want to give his YouTube YouTube channel a shout out. He and I have been contact and been in contact, and he actually met with Amanda Joe. She was able to get him into uh, Grindavik, where he was able to do some footage, and he agreed to share some of that with us. So we're we are collaborating quite well at the moment, and as soon as we get this eruption, this next event over and done with. Um, he and I are, are trying to figure out a date where he can come on. His probably his interview probably will be a live stream episode. Um, and so that's something to look forward to. So I'm interested and excited to get to know him a little bit better, ask him about some of his uh, videography projects and what he does, a little bit more about his background, maybe, maybe answer some questions he might have about, about the geology. Uh, and so look for another another interview with this gentleman in the coming weeks as well. And then finally, but certainly not uh, last in terms of order, we're going to do a interview with our moderator and the real MVP of my channel, and that's Amanda Joe. So she lived through all the events leading up to where we're at today. So she was in her house in Godindavik and felt the earthquakes. On November 10th, she was there in late October with some of the events leading up to it. She's, you know, since relocated and is looking at selling her house to the government. So she, I think it would be really cool to get her perspective on exactly what went down in Grindavik from sort of a resident's point of view. Talk to her about maybe a little bit about her, how she became through through the events happening in her community, right? Like her community was in geologic upheaval. But I think through that, and she can speak to this better than I can, she was able to find some interest and passion in understanding and learning geology a little bit more. And so this will be fun because she and I have talked a lot. We share messages every day, but a lot of the times our messages are sort of like just business, if you will, like in terms of her sending me information for an update, what's going on in Iceland. 
um, and I'm interested to get to know her a little bit better and find out more of her backstory. So, so that'll be pretty cool. So we've got three interviews coming up very soon, one of which will take place for sure uh, this coming Friday, and the other two probably soon to follow, if not maybe sooner. We'll just have to see. I'm kind of, Amanda Joe and, and, and Gilfi obviously are, you know, the, the eruption that might take place here soon is a bit more of a priority. So we're planning on doing something as soon as, as soon as the lava clears, as they say. So, um, okay. So those are some fun little uh, bits of announcements and some things to look forward to. And I'm really excited to be able to branch out a little bit. This channel started, if you've been with me since the early days, this thing started with just me outside doing field-based videos. And for the longest time, I thought that's, that's what's important. That's, that, that's what people are going to enjoy. Um, but what I've since found, especially with the Iceland events that have transpired over the last few months, is that there's also a very big audience and a lot of interest in looking at the data. And it's, you know, what I've learned to realize is it's okay to sit here at my computer like I am right now and talk to people like I am right now. And there's good value in that. Uh, if you told me that two years ago, I'd say, no, that's not the way to do it. That's, that's not gonna, that's not gonna attract people to geology. You got to be out in the field and you got to like show them the rocks. And I think there's a lane for that. I think that's still important. Um, but I think I'm learning that, that there's multiple ways and multiple venues to promote geology education. So a um, couple other just general announcements, and then we'll get to our Iceland update. So Amanda Joe has been working hard on putting together a website for me. And I think this is definitely due, maybe a little bit overdue. And this would be a place to go to where you can get field trip info. If you want to buy uh, one of the books I've written, there's links there, maybe links to some of the other Icelandic uh, data that we look at instead of me having to always put that in the video descriptions. I've got a couple of emails I haven't got, I haven't re replied to yet. And I apologize about people asking about just general geology books that I would recommend if they want to learn more. I haven't, I haven't forgotten those emails. I just haven't been able to reply to those yet. So just looking at this as a, a repository of information that's related to the things we do here. So I'm hoping that we can probably get that up and running here in the next month or so. Um, the other thing here is logo ideas. I have someone else working on some different logo ideas for kind of, I guess, kind of branding the channel. I don't know, friends, I'm figuring this out for the first time. So I don't know. So if you have any ideas, um, this person's working is a graphic designer and a geologist and they're working on it. But if you have any really cool ideas you want to just sketch out and send to me as an email, or um, if you have anything cool, I guess you could put on the live chat that maybe Amanda Joe could grab in terms of like a, a fun little phrase or moniker that we could use. I guess the logos would not just go on the videos and help with a little bit of branding, but it also would be maybe eventually some of this could be like like merchandise that people could get, t-shirts, mugs, hats, whatever. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Like I know the random road cut people are super into their random road cuts. And I think that would be a pretty cool little, um, you know, like some sort of little graphical image and the random road cut logo. Uh, I'd wear that t-shirt. I'd wear that with pride. So I don't know, just some ideas there, but send me whatever cool thing you have. I probably want to steer away from all the typical geology puns we've already are already heard things with the term schist and nice and tough i don't know like i don't want it to be too cheesy and corny i want it to be something that's identifiable maybe it includes my last name maybe it includes kind of our team geo learning concept i'm open to different ideas so just something to consider there so uh and then another note here is that if you're here in the u.s you know this is coming unless you're in arizona uh, and that is our time is switching tonight from standard time to daylight time. So won't be a big issue for many of you. Just letting you know that instead of it saying mountain standard time, it will be mountain daylight time moving forward. And instead of seven hours difference between where I'm located in Iceland, uh, it'll be one hour less and it'll be six hours different. So um, that'll just make it slightly easier in my head to figure out the time difference. Uh, and then finally, I will be gone out of the country with my wife and some friends. This is our spring break. We will be in um, Vienna, Prague, and then we'll spend a couple days in New York City on the way back. 
and but I will make sure that there's some content that will come out while that during that period while I'm gone. I'll also make sure I take my laptop with me. Oh, and that should say March, not May. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and and fix that here, team. Sorry about that. Not May, actually March. So this month. There you go. March 20th to the 30th. I'll make sure that there's still some videos that get uh, posted every few days or so. Might be some of those interview series, uh, but I'll have my laptop with me. So if something big goes down and a live stream or an update is warranted, I'll make sure I get something out there. So, alrighty, I think we went through all the fun announcements. Good stuff. And now without further ado, let's move into our update on Iceland. So let's start with our Met Office update. This came out yesterday. I found this pretty interesting. Um, and I have a big question on this too. So I'm eager to see if anyone can help me out with this. I did email uh, Professor Thorlerson yesterday, but by the time I emailed him, it was probably evening, his time, Friday evening, and now it's Saturday. So I didn't expect an answer before today. But uh, anyway, so model calculations show that the magma tunnel or what we're talking about as an intrusion of magma that pushed through the rocks and, and stayed in the subsurface that formed last Saturday, March 2nd, was about, excuse me, three kilometers long and reached from Stora Stogafell to Hagafell. So that's, um, th they're locating this intrusion and they also have an estimate of its length. Uh, let me just show you the map real quick here. So they are, here's, uh, let's zoom out just a skosh. There we go. Grindavik here, January 14th eruption down here near town. The December and February eruption sites up here overlapping. And they are locating this magma intrusion last Saturday, March 2nd, right here. My big question is how they did that. Um, I couldn't figure out how they actually determined the location, the orientation, and the length of it. Um, if they're using GPS data. Uh, I'm not disputing anything that's put on here. They always do good work with their science. I'm just curious exactly how that was that data was derived. Um, continuing on with the update, the magma in the intrusion lies at a depth of 1.2 kilometers where it's shallowest and reaches a depth of about 3.9 kilometers. So it got to within about a kilometer of the surface. So a little, little more than half a mile. According to the model calculations, about 1.3 million cubic meters of magma flowed into this region during the March 2nd intrusion. So we knew that that number had been out there a few days ago. There is a much smaller amount of magma than in previous events, but model calculations show that around 10 million cubic meters or more flowed from the magma reservoir under Svartsengi over here to the east into this older um, fissure and crater system. All things considered, the magma looks for the easiest way to the surface, and it's hard to say what prevented it this time. It could be some obstruction in the flow of the magma, not enough volume, or pressure to open a fissure, or even a combination of these factors. Um, this is just a little side note here, and maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I should say this. Maybe it's, <laughs> maybe, maybe my ego is creeping in here. But I've been reading these Met Office updates for five months now, and... I, th I feel like their updates over time have gotten better and they're doing a little bit better job of explaining the data. And I don't know if that's because of me or the interest from the general public or I, d I have no idea. And so it is incredibly vain of me to, to suspect that that they're trying to explain things better the way I try to. But uh, I think this is coming out all wrong. But my point is that I think they're doing a much better job of taking the science and instead of giving a scientific update, they are explaining it using words and terms that make it much easier for the public to understand. And I think I just appreciate that. So I thought this little sentence here was was very nice and I think was very um, informative to uh, the general public. So uh, continuing, the magma flow on March 2nd behaved differently than previous magma flows. And it's really not a magma flow, it's an intrusion. This is the um, Google translated version. They don't have this in English yet. Very different than the intrusions during the summer and is a reason to study it further in order to further increase the understanding of the nature of intrusions in the region and to understand what the continuation of the events will be. 
Looking at the history of other volcanic eruptions, it is not uncommon for an intrusion to end without an eruption or for, yeah, magma to move through the system. In fact, that's pretty common. During the 10-year period at the Krafla fires in the 70s and 80s, there were about 20 intrusions and nine of them ended with an eruption. So about 50% uh, you know, success rate, if you will, in terms of magma actually reaching the surface. Uh, the magma flows from Sart Singi to the Sunduks Crater Series have become five in number since November. <clears throat> Three of them have ended in eruption. However, nothing can be said at this stage that the sequence of events will behave like the upheaval in Krafla. Yep. So, so a very nice update from the Met Office. Very informative. And I, it might be me. I'd have to like go back and you know study the language a little bit and and see if there's anything to this. But my my gut feeling is that their updates have become a little less technical in terms of language and a little bit more accessible in terms of the language they use. And that was the, really the point I was making. And so um, so I appreciate that, whether that was uh, done intentionally or whether that's just sort of evolved over time. It's, it's just good to see. Okay, earthquakes. Um, earthquakes have been tricky the last few days because the weather has been stormy and windy and just typical kind of Iceland conditions. And so we we haven't had a lot of earthquakes here and certainly not any that are incredibly telling. There was one anomalous event yesterday that was a 2.8 just north of uh, Grindavik near the southeast side of the hill there, uh, Thorpjörn. And so this was about five kilometers down. That's the typical depth we see of the magma reservoir. But this thing was kind of a one-off. It didn't it didn't turn into anything else. And so my interpretation is it was not related to magma migration or movement in the subsurface. It was just, you know, the magma is pushing outwards. The system is pressurizing. That stress is causing adjacent faults and fractures to fail and shift and move and generate their own seismic signal. There's been a couple of small, or not just small quakes today, but also shallow quakes. You can see these red ones here are shallower. Uh, than the orange and yellow ones. Um, but again, these happened uh, earlier today in Iceland, like in the morning or the afternoon, and nothing really came of it. So while there's several of them, there's maybe what, six there, red ones, uh, maybe seven, if you count that one. None of it looks really telling to me. None of it is the type of signal we would expect to see from uh, a magma body that's moving towards the surface and ultimately going to culminate in some sort of eruption. So, so earthquakes have been hampered a little bit with the, with the weather, I think is the, the big thing. But nonetheless, I, I still contend that, you know, tens of minutes before the next eruptive event, we should see a flurry of concentrated earthquakes near the future event location. So whenever our next eruptive event occurs, I still think there'll be a, maybe not a strong se seismic signal, but a notable seismic signal uh, that shows up in the data. Uh, and it should, it should still show up to some degree, even with the weather, because some of these stations, seismograph stations are close enough to where the magma is going to be propagating upwards and fracturing and breaking rock that it's going to generate that that signal no matter what. So, but we'll have to see moving forward. Um, this is just another summary. This kind of shows you how hit and miss the earthquakes have been over the past 48 hours. Uh, there's that one anomalous 2.8 kind of all by itself, but you can see that not a lot happening here, but again, we think that that's at least partly, if not mainly due to the the weather that's been taking place. And while we're on the subject of earthquakes, um, Amanda Joe sent me this article just literally minutes before our uh, update began here, our live stream. So uncertain if the earthquakes are behaving differently. It's difficult to interpret isolated earthquakes like the one that happened at Hagafelt. So they're specifically talking about that one 2.8, that bigger one right there that happened yesterday, and how hard it is to really uh, assess that. So there's a little bit of information down here. It's difficult to interpret isolated earthquakes like this one. It was 2.8, according to Benedict Ofigson. Uh, and I have reached out to him with an email. I'm hoping he might be willing to come on for an interview as well. I'm sure he's incredibly busy. He heads up the ground deformation GPS measurement section. Um, so we'll see if he ever can get back to me. But 
he basically says, look, it's really hard to tell, you know, just one notable earthquake in isolation without like a cluster or trend or more data points uh, just is really tricky to interpret. And one in and of itself doesn't mean that anything significant is happen happening. Okay, GPS data. I did hear from Amanda Jo that she had heard through some sources that possibly the GPS data the last couple of days was also being affected by the really strong winds. And so we have to take the GPS data with a bit of a grain of salt as well. So with that caveat in mind, let's look at a few stations. Here's the Svart Sengi station. This is the station that's closest to the magma body that uh, is under the power plant and a little bit to the southwest. Uh, and you can see there was a little stall. Let me zoom in on that just for kicks. And there goes my light again. Some of you enjoy watching my office lights turn off every eight minutes or so if I don't wiggle and move around enough for the motion sensor. But you can see the GPS data was trending upwards. Uplift was occurring due to magma intrusion. But then the last few days, maybe three or four days, it seemed to have slowed down quite a bit. Uh, and then the last point goes up, but again, with the wind and such and the weather, not sure we can put a whole lot of confidence in that one point out there all by itself. So we'll continue to kind of wait and monitor, but the, it, the uplift does seem to be continuing just at a slower pace than it has previously. So those rocks have been heated by the magma intruding from below. As they get hotter, they're able to behave a little more elastically so they can stretch and bend as more magma and pressure enters the system uh, without breaking. But at some point, you have, you have some critical limit. You have the rocks at their, their brittle failure point, and then that will either inject magma into the subsurface as an intrusion like we saw last Saturday or possibly result in an eruption. Here's the Blue Lagoon's uh, last little trend of data sets as well. Again, just that one, that last point in the data set that kind of jumps up there. And then let's make sure the last data points coming. Oh yeah, so this is pretty much up to date. It's coming on March 9th. Um, yeah, so the last run was about 10 a.m. Uh, UTC time. So it is still capturing data. The weather's not impacting that. But that one point there may be anomalous or may be part of some future trend. If we go off to the west and look at the Elverp station, um, same sort of thing. Although notice that in Jan after the January 14th event, we had steady uplift. And then days before the February 8th eruption, we had it sort of stagnate and plateau. Whereas here we had more or less steady uplift, maybe a little bit of stagnation here. Another trend here, but the last little, you know, couple of days here does look like it's trending upwards a bit, which is interesting. So, um, yeah, what to make of the GPS data? It's just a good way. It's a good way to see that the system is continuing to receive magma from depth as long as we see uplift. But we also know we're at that critical estimated volume of magma which should initiate some sort of response in the system. We should get, we should have the, you know, going back to Professor Thorderson's analogy, the, the, the system is pressurized, the lid's going to need to lift, and that's gonna send magma out uh, of the, the magma body out into the system or away from the system and into the rocks adjacent to it, which could result in an eruption or could result in an intrusion. So uh, I think that's it for the GPS data. So. The gentleman from Just Icelandic, Gilfi, uh, allowed me access to some of his uh, video files, and he puts together and edits really slick videos. I, I don't have that skill set, but I thought there was a couple sort of B-roll clips that he gave me that might be worth uh, just looking at for a minute. So this video here shows the berm that still, they're still working on. Let me make myself a little smaller there. So they're still working on that that berm. So they're kind of I think this is looking to to the north. That's the road that goes up to the Blue Lagoon from uh, Godindavik. There's that January 14th lava flow that lapped up against it. There's the greenhouse that's just on this side of the berm. So they put a few access roads in there. It looks like they're collecting material from some of these quarries nearby. Um, but he just had a nice little drone image. Of that you can see some of the water vapor and gases actually coming out of the berm right there 
Oh, and now the video is buffering a little bit. I'll have to see if it catches up. Yeah, and I loaded this yesterday, so um, the computer may not be happy with this. Anyway, um, we can maybe skip through that, but that just nicely shows uh, some nice aerial footage that he collected. So thanks again to Gilfi from his Just Icelandic YouTube channel for sharing that with us. Um, we'll see if that one pops up again. This one here is so remember the, on the big day. I mean, if we ha if we had a one of the big highlights of this channel, at least for me, and I know a lot of you was on January 14th when we saw that Fisher. Um, evolve and erupt that was closest to town that ended up uh, destroying three homes unfortunately this is that small lava field there and so he has some nice imagery here of this very steep spatter cone this is uh, exceptionally little steep body here so probably very sticky magma was erupting from the vent initially to form something that steep sided but the fissure runs sort of along this trend here you can see there's still it's still cooling, there's still degassing going on. Uh, so just really nice video footage from Gilfi on this. So um, let's see what else we've got here. He's kind of panning around, looking down towards the houses there. Great stuff, great work. Much smoother. So one of the things when I use the Nature Eye drone, um, I have my own drone here, and so I can say that this is true. Remember when I have the Nature Eye drone, I, all I can do is push a button on my keyboard and it goes forwards or backwards at whatever speed. But when you're actually using your own drone, you have little joysticks and they're they're touch sensitive, right? So you can just shove it a little bit forward and it will the drone will move slowly forward. If you shove it all the way forward, it goes faster. And unfortunately, with the Nature Eye drones, at least right now, it doesn't have that touch sensitivity. So my my footage will never be kind of as smooth as as some of the stuff we're seeing here done by the by the pros. Uh, and then this I thought was fun too. I remember actually seeing this during our drone flight, um, or maybe it was on the webcam later. There was this lava flow that like pushed up against, I mean, it wrapped around this fence adjacent to this home and somehow just miraculously or fortuitously never actually burned the fence and the lava, the lava basically just came along and kissed this corner of this picket fence and never actually f pushed it over with the force of the lava. So it was just incredibly lucky set of circumstances that um, kind of came to be on that day. And, and Gail Fee kind of points it out in one of his videos that just came out recently. So, but yeah, I thought that was just a, a really nice bit of footage there. And just kind of, there's one of the homes that was unfortunately just completely burned and decimated uh, this house would have been next had this eruption lasted literally tens of minutes longer there's no doubt this lava flow would have progressed past the fence and been on the house there here's where another one of the homes were here um, but just yeah it was pretty crazy that's the you know it may I guess if there's a symbol of the resolve of the Icelandic people and the Grudinovic community maybe it's this fence here right that should be like their, there's their logo right there is this fun little fence so anyway, thanks to uh, Gilfi for sharing those. I just wanted to show you some of that uh, imagery that he sent there. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, this was sent to me by a viewer um, whose name is uh, Sandrine. I think she, this person's in France. And this is um, one of the Icelandic geologists, uh, Armand Hoskelsen. And I, I'll put the link to the, the video clip if you want to watch it. It's in Icelandic, but it has English subtitles. But basically in it, he, he talks about, again, going back to Elvorp. And I still haven't, I guess my interview with Professor Thorlerson provided some insights. The, the big reason that they're hung up on this area being a likely site for a future eruption is it's more or less in the center of this plate boundary zone. Remember, a plate boundary is not a discrete line on the map. It's a zone. And right now, where we have the eruption happening northeast of Gurindavik, that is the sort of eastern margin of that zone. And then you can head all the way out to the uh, tip of the, the Reykjanes Peninsula, where the lighthouse is, and the, there's another geothermal power plant out there. That's sort of the western margin. And so 
geologists like this gentleman here still think that at some point this magma system is going to find a pathway to this location here. And I don't dispute that whatsoever. I just wonder how they can be so adamant about that claim when we have clearly established pathways uh, for this magma body right now. And we have seen no evidence or signs that the magma is moving to the west and, and establishing pathways and channels and exploiting fracture systems in the rocks to the west where it might erupt here. So could it erupt there? Sure, like I'll put that out there just along with everyone else. Um, but I just wonder why, why they're being just so uh, insistent upon it. And maybe they're right, we'll have to see moving forward, but just, just really would like to know what the data um, is that supports that. Uh, okay, so you can watch that. I'll put that on the, uh, the, in the video description later. Okay, the last thing I want to do here before we get to your questions team is I want to break down a paper that I've read recently. I, I try to digest an Iceland, a paper on Iceland geology as much as I can. Uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks with grading and classes and you know how it is. Sometimes you're, you, you get kind of bogged down in all the work you have to do and you can't come up for air. But I did have some time yesterday to read this paper by uh, Paul Einarsson, uh, and I recognize his name. He's with the uh, University of Iceland as well. These other individuals, I didn't look them up, but good bet that those are students that have worked with him on this research and helped him with this paper. So I am a, my my specialty in geology I've learned volcanoes over time, but back in school, when I went to graduate school, my specialty is actually in structural geology. So faults, folds, how rocks deform, how tectonic stresses manifest themselves in the Earth's crust. That's my specialty. So I've been really interested in trying to figure out a little bit more about how the um, plate tectonic stresses are actually manifesting themselves on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And so this really was helpful to me and, and it did a nice job of uh, painting a picture. I'll make sure I put a link to this as well. I think, I'm not sure if it's totally accessible off the internet, but I have it downloaded and I can put it on like a, a Dropbox site for you guys to read if you're interested. And I also put together a, a graphic, let's see, an image. I gotta find it here, there we go. Um, that might help explain this a little bit more. So here what I have, make myself a little bigger there, is a Google Earth image of the Reykjanes Peninsula. And so I think, at least on my channel, we've never gone to this depth about explaining the tectonic forces and sort of the orientation of things to this degree. So I think most of you know that Iceland is both a hotspot and it's a divergent plate boundary where the plates are spreading apart. So we have the North American plate moving to the west, the Eurasian plate more or less moving to the east. What I've done here is drawn with the big, bright, fat arrows. That is the direction of absolute plate motion. So the North American plate at this part of Iceland is moving in exactly at exactly that azimuthal direction that I show there. I actually measured that out. It wasn't just an arrow I threw on there. So it's actually moving at about, you know, um, north 75 degrees west, if you want to use that as a, a compass heading. Um, and then similarly over here on the Eurasian plate. So the plate boundary runs through here. And when we see it on maps, it just looks like a line. It looks like a not perfectly east-west line, but a, you know, a east or a, a west-southwest to east-northeast line that kind of cuts through the Reykjanes Peninsula. Superimposed on this, what I've done is put together some red lines that trace pretty well, as best I could, the location of some of the recent volcanic systems or volcanic fissures in the area. So here is the Elverp system that uh, some of the Icelandic scientists are so focused on. Here's the one that is being occupied by the active magma intrusion right now, the Sunukurgigar Sunuk crater row that sits right here northeast of Grindavik. There's another one out near the tip of the peninsula where the plate bound, where the these fracture systems come on shore um, 
I know this produced the Stampar lava flows. I don't know what the name of this system is, un unfortunately. Uh, then you have uh, the Fagra Dalsfiat one is in here. We'll get to that in a second. And then you have sort of the, the Krishuvik system near Lake Klevravatn. Uh, I'm going to mess up the names here. Brennan Steinfeld system. And then going off the map here is the Hengil system. But what we can see here, what I want to point out is that the orientation of these red lines that I've drawn on this map are not perpendicular to the yellow arrows. They might look like it, but they're not. They're like anywhere from 30, maybe 40, maybe up to 50 degrees off of being what we would call orthogonal or perpendicular to the plate motion. So what that means is that the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland is a bit of an anomaly because it is where the divergent plate boundary comes ashore, but it's not a pure divergent plate boundary. The plates aren't spreading perpendicular to the trend or the boundary of the plate there. And the volcanic systems sort of delineate that a little bit. Um, so I hope I'm, I'm describing it well here. So what th this area is, the Reykjanes Peninsula is actually what we would call an oblique divergent plate boundary, which means that not only is it opening, right, it's extensional, so it's opening up, but there's a side to side component, a strike slip or transform component to it as well. So it has both types of motion across this plate boundary, both transform motion like the San Andreas Fault and also divergent motion where it's spreading apart. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So because it has both types of motion, it you would expect then the fault types to be not just normal faults, which result from extension where the foot wall goes up and the hanging wall goes down. If you don't know the names of all these faults and everything I'm covering here, uh, don't worry about it. I, I do plan to get to at some point a a video series on fault types. I know a lot of people are asking for unconformities. Uh, the list is long. I've got a big long list of ideas. I'll, I'll hopefully just get to those soon. Um, anyway, so it's both normal faults that are that are caused by extension, right? The rocks moving in opposite directions or might be oblique extension. And then also these strike slip faults that are moving things side to side. So let's dig into the paper here. Um, and what, where they're focusing on here, this is a paper that came out in 2023, uh, I think early in 2023, if I'm not mistaken, Bulletin of Volcanology. And they're specifically looking at the Fagradalsfjall area. So the area that had eruptions uh, here in 2021 to up until this last summer, 2023. So we have the Svartsengi, Elvorp, uh, Sunukur crater system here. You could just lump those together, I suppose. Way over here by the lake, we have the Krishuvik system. And this area is a bit of an anomaly. This, What's interesting as I read this paper is had you gone back to, um, you know, 20, 2020, I guess, and said, hey, we're going to, there's going to be an eruption on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And you asked 50 scientists or anyone really, it didn't have to be scientists, to predict based on past eruptive behaviors, based on mapped and known volcanic features, where where's this thing gonna erupt? And everyone went to the map and put a little pin on the map predicting where they thought the Reykjanes system was going to erupt. I don't think anyone would have put it <clears throat> in this area here because there hadn't been an eruption there for a long time. Most of the volcanic products in this area aren't even lava flows. A lot of them are, some of them are lava flows, but a lot of them are the um, glacial, subglacial volcanic products like hyaloclastite, pillow lavas. So they hadn't erupted for a really long time. And of course, you'd probably like hunt around and look for these existing and obvious fissure systems on Google Earth. And that's what I would have picked too. Like I would have said, well, like, you know, what's the, what's the youngest one? And, you know, it, it might have been a crapshoot, but you would have picked one of these red lines as the most likely place for an eruption if you could, could go back in 2020 uh, or 2019, I suppose, prior to any sort of uh, evidence that the magma was, was getting ready to erupt. Uh, but as such, it, of course, erupted here, which is kind of interesting. So we had three eruptions in this area. Uh, fortuitously, these eruptions occurred kind of in this uh, highland area with some topography. They filled in these valleys. The lava flows never uh, left the valleys and came down to the roadways. It was not a 
concern for Grindavik. In fact, it was a big tourist boom for Grindavik. Those three or four years when tourists would come through, stay in the hotels, eat in the restaurants, buy stuff in the shops, and then drive, you know, 10, 15 minutes over here to the car park and then hike in and go see the volcanoes erupt. So getting back to the paper, uh, that's the area that they're focusing on. Um, they talk about, without kind of boring you here, there. so there's the different systems there, just kind of showing you the graphics. So uh, Grindavik's right here. Um, the, this, this, the Sunukur crater system that where our intrusion and eruptions have taken place is on the eastern margin of this Reykjanes, um fissure swarm. That's what RFS stands for. The Elvorp one's in the middle, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, some of these scientists think it's going to erupt there. And then you have these other ones out here to the to the west. But then you have the Krishuvik system, so on and so forth. So this was the area they studied uh, between these two known sort of volcanic systems or fissure systems. They're like, hey, let's look at where these eruptions took place and see if we can figure out anything with the structures. And so what they did was they used um, uh, aerial photography, field mapping, digital elevation models, and they mapped out all the fractures and faults in the area. So this map shows with the stars where the eruption sites were, and then you can see with their red lines there some of the places where they mapped out some of these fractures and faults. And what they found was something kind of interesting. Um, most of the faults in this area run pretty close, pretty much true north-south, and you can see that a little bit there. Maybe we can zoom in a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. Um, so a lot of these faults run north-south, which is interesting because the the dominant structural trend or grain on the Reykjanes is this northeast-southwest trend. I mean, you can see it in the topography. You can see it when you look at the fissure systems. Um, you know, even out here, you can see these little subtle changes in slope uh, that are probably fault systems. Everything's running northeast-southwest, almost exclusively. And yet here we had these north-south trending faults. And most of those north-south trending faults they found out were actually strike-slip faults. So they're not moving things up and down or even opening like we'd expe expect with extension. They're moving things laterally. Uh, so they're moving things back and forth. So here's some of the, the field photos, which are kind of cool. So in some places, what they're seeing and mapping as fault systems is areas between the fault systems. They might get places where, because the fault movement is sideways, but there can be a tiny bit of compression between those, you actually get rocks pushed up. So you can see right here in figure B uh, behind the two people here, you can see the rocks like piled up there. Uh, and so they call these sort of push-ups. Um, and so these occur where you get just a little bit of compression there. Other places you might see these little <clears throat> um, sort of collapse features or open fractures running through um, kind of the mossy grasses here. You can see the, the active eruptive field out there in the distance. So this just shows you some of the evidence that they were able to look for and at in order to map these things out. Here's a little closer up view. So then several pages of the paper is just their, just their data and going over like how they kind of um, took all these fractures and then collectively grouped them into different domains. This is one of the shield volcanoes here. You can see some fractures here. And again, you can see most of these red lines run very close to north-south in terms of their trend. Uh, here's another little zone with, again, these ones are slightly turning a little bit northeast, but very close to, you know, north to maybe north 30 degrees east in terms of their, their structural trend. Uh, another little area focused in on here and then the trend of those there. So um, anyway, the last thing I want to get to here, so I found it to be really interesting that the it, that in this zone, uh, one, this was a place you wouldn't have expected there to be volcanic activity. And especially with most of the faults being strike slip faults, that would seem to inhibit pathways for the magma to come up. You want to have a structural zone where the rocks are moving apart and creating open fractures. That's going to create a better system of uh, permeability for the magma to rise. Um, and hopefully this is making sense and isn't maybe, hopefully people aren't getting too bored with this. This is a stress diagram. Um, so anyway, the, the dikes are opening up along this northeast southwest trend because that's the direction of the least compressive stress. Uh, so sigma one 
is the direction of the um, the or excuse me that's the maximum compressive stress so in with the stress oriented this way that makes it easy to fractures to open up along that trend but open up this way but what it also means is you get two sets of conjugate fractures or faults shown in the red and yellow here they're about 60 degrees apart from each other uh, so you get these right lateral strike slip faults sideways moving faults horizontal motion and then the faults that do trend east west ish uh, tend to have left lateral motion. So the point is that this type of structural style um, is compatible with these sort of stress conditions. So, uh, and then, then they talk about bookshelf faulting, but they didn't have a good diagram. So I actually found one that will help a little bit. And this is my last point, and then we'll get to your viewer questions here. So hopefully you found this interesting. Maybe we're too deep in the weeds with structural geology and half of you gone to refill your coffee mug or doing something else. But if we think of these big fat arrows here as being the plate motion, right? So those are essentially no different uh, than what I've shown you here, my big yellow arrows, right? Same sort of thing. Now imagine that these, these faults here, these are the north-south or north-south-ish trending um, strike-slip faults. So if you have um, plate motion shown by the big arrows, you can get these sort of bookshelf, that's why it's called bookshelves. It looks like they're all leaning on their side, but this isn't cross-section view, this is map view looking down on the ground. And so you can see you get these right lateral moving north-south trending faults that would accommodate this stress across the peninsula. And these are probably, I mean, th this is just one little area around Fagradalsfjall, but these are one zone when we're seeing earthquakes and everyone's getting excited about, oh my gosh, it's magma moving. Remember that there's just as many strike slip faults as faults that are extensional and strike slip faults are not going to provide pathways for the most part for magma to migrate through. They're moving past each other. There's still a lot of friction on those faults and they're not opening up fracture space for the magma to migrate. So just um, something as a bit of a reminder there. So um, I think that's all I've got. I could have probably gone on 20 more minutes on the paper because I really enjoyed it. Um, had some good insights, but that's like my little take on it uh, more or less there. So. And then we'll just take a quick look at what's going on. It looks like there is not a whole lot going on. It's a little bit rainy. The clouds are moving quickly. Uh, and we just haven't seen a lot of earthquakes here. So the wait continues. There you go. If there's a thousand people watching the webcams, just fixated, hoping to catch the first glimpse of the eruption, which they might. That would be great. So, okay, friends, um, that's it for what I had for you. Hopefully that was, it was a bit longer of an update because I covered the paper there, but hopefully there was some good information there. Let me go now to the question sheet from Amanda Joe. And thanks as always to our moderators for uh, doing the heavy lifting over there, um, moderating the live chat, aggregating the questions. It makes my life so much easier. Some of you might have remembered the old days where I actually tried to do this all on my own and it was definitely a little bit a little bit rougher. Let me take a quick drink. Alrighty, let's dive in and let's see if we can get some of these questions answered. From Morrow, I'd like to ask about the Earth's crust in the short run, say the next few hundred million years, give or take, right? That's the short run. Uh, what happens? Is it growing in thickness? Does the core heat heat keep up and move the plates? Thanks. Um, so the Earth's crust does get thicker in some places where we have convergent plate boundaries. So when plates are colliding, especially when two continents are colliding, like uh, India and Asia, where we have the Himalayas, that collision started about 30 million years ago, and it continues today. The Himalayas are still being pushed up. The crust is being thickened. The rocks are being squished together. We still have earthquakes there as part of that process. That it, Think of it as like a slow motion collision that's still going on. So in some places, the Earth's crust is, is getting thicker, but in other places, it might be getting thinner. Um, what, what I can say with certainty is that the, the size of our planet isn't getting bigger or smaller. So more or less, the amount of crust that we subduct at a subduction zone, the amount of crust that gets recycled there equals the amount of crust that's generated at a divergent 
uh, plate boundary. And the core has plenty of heat. Our planet is cooling off very slowly. There's the initial primordial heat from all the chunks of rock in the solar system that came together to form the Earth, but it also has radioactive heat from radioactive decay. Um, so we are cooling off at some point. I don't know what the models say, whether it's, I don't think it's a few hundred million years. I think it's way longer timescales than that, billions of years. Um, our planet possibly cools off to the center. The core no longer has heat. That no longer drives convective motion in the mantle. That kills plate tectonics. And then the, the continents and the land gets eroded uh, pretty quickly. And then we end up with, possibly we end up with like Water World, if you ever saw that terrible movie from the 90s. So um, yeah, hopefully that helped a little bit there. From Susie Jones, can you give us any telltale signs of the difference between a tectonic quake and magma movement quake, please? Thank you for saying please, Susie. Um, this is the tricky stuff, right? This is what I asked Professor Thorderson about, and he said, you tell me. Um, I think when magma is moving in the subsurface, there's other signs that will go with that, dominantly ground deformation. And so tectonic quakes tend to be one movement, right? The, the rocks are under stress, then they fail. If it's a big enough earthquake, it might generate some aftershocks. And you might get a little cluster, you know, like here's an earthquake with ch -ch 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 pop, 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 pop over the next few days or some uh, aftershock earthquakes associated with that. And then it kind of it kind of dies down. Um, so there's things we can do that can tell us whether one is suggestive over another. But the way I understand it, and I'm not a geophysicist, is that it's very difficult to tell unless you have some other data. So just the earthquake in and of itself and its location in space is oftentimes not enough. And that's really what we're trying to do. Now, in the case of the Reykjanes Peninsula, my default, knowing just how active this area is tectonically, you know, is to consider any quake a tectonic earthquake, unless I'm seeing it in areas where I know I already have magma, like around Svartsingi and, and Grindavik, then maybe I look, I look at that data set a little bit differently. But certainly right now, I feel like any quakes on the Reykjanes um, in Iceland are most likely tectonic until we have other data to suggest otherwise. So, uh, Daisy82, um, are the quakes at Reykjanes Krieger rela somehow related to actual situation? Oh, good. Then Amanda Jo like helps me know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know where that is, I think. It's at the tip of the peninsula, right? Yeah, the quake that occurred at 1524 today. So let's just double check and make sure we've got uh, the right location here. Um, so it's not that one. Is it this one out here? Oh yeah, so it's this one out here by LD. So it's these quakes out here, is that correct? Um, let's go back to the question to make sure. So they want to know, are the quakes somehow related to the actual situation? I suppose by actual situation, you mean the magma chamber and volcanic activity. I would say no right now. Um, just these little one-off quakes, again, I think are just tectonic stress release, seven, eight kilometers depth. Yeah, that's, you know, you don't see anything else happening that would indicate that it's magma ascent and magma moving its way up towards the the seafloor. So, yep, uh, that's the way I would answer that. And hopefully that's not too brief, just, so are they somehow related? I don't think so. You might get another geologist has a different opinion, but um, I don't believe so. From Felda Emerson, good morning, Sean. Good morning, Felda. Are the dikes coming from the sill similar to the lava tube at craters? No, those are two different things. So. It's hard for us to see, it's hard for us to envision what's happening, what these dikes and sills look like. That's why um, any sort of graphic we can do, whether it's one of my little cross sections I've tried to draw, or I remember we had a viewer, uh, John Adams, that did these beautiful 3D color ones that were just fantastic. That is gonna help us understand the situation better. However, those drawings are highly fictitious. That's what I like to call geofantasy. Um, they don't look like that. Lava tubes will be near surface features created 
where a lava flow at the surface crusts over on top. That crusted over surface uh, above the lava flow insulates the rest of the lava flow. It continues to move downhill, down, down the gradient, uh, until the supply of magma wanes and slows down and runs out, and then you're left with a hollow tube. When we go to places like Craters of the Moon or other places, whether it's Iceland or elsewhere, and there's lava tubes in lots of places, uh, we go into that as a cave, and that's what the lava tube represents. But they're typically pretty close to the surface. Lava tubes um, are prone to collapse. So if we ha so the lava tubes are near the surface. If we have a bunch of lava flows stacked on top of that at a later time, um, that lava tube's just not going to persist. It's going to end up getting collapsed, fractured. So the dikes down five kilometers underneath the power plant area coming from the sill are moving through fractures, cracks in the rock. They're moving through any pore space they can get. Maybe instead of a vertical crack, it could be a slanted crack. It could be a horizontal zone between lava flows where there's a little bit more permeability and it's more rubbly there. That's what the, the magma is moving through. It's not moving through a lava tube. Now, that being said, could there be a little section of a lava tube still preserved underneath this region. Sure, like I'm not going to say that's not the case, um, but what I don't want to imply is that the lava, the magma is moving through these connected subway tunnels uh, like lava tubes, because that's probably, um, that's, yeah, that's just not accurate. Tree hugger, does the cluster of quakes by the southwest of town mean there is more room for magma and will delay pressure for the eruption? Um, not necessarily. So a lot of the quakes I think that are happening um, right now, southwest of town, maybe in this area, are stress release. So you, you've, you're inflating the balloon over here uh, up by the power plant, right? And so that, that's sending pressure. That pressure is, that compressive stress is being pushed out on the rocks. Remember all the GPS stations are moving, not only are some of them moving up, but they're also moving away from this magma chamber. So, and we can measure that, we can see that with the GPS data. So it's moving away. So that stress is manifesting itself as releasing these very small, uh, small earthquakes, microquakes below magnitude one in this case. Um, and that's not necessarily related to magma pushing on the rocks. So I think most of these are regular faults reacting to the stress of the region, which is partially, if not mostly, dictated by this magma reservoir inflating and becoming more pressurized. Good questions here, team. You guys are coming in on a Saturday just with your guns firing. Just great. Uh, Patsy, what are the similarities between the November 10th intrusion and March 2nd, if any? Could there be as long a lull before the new eruption? I think a big difference between those two, even though they're in nearly the same area. So if we go back to, yeah, this here. Um, well, a couple differences. They're along the same, tr well, similarities. They're along the same trend, but the November 10th intrusion went offshore to the southwest of Grindavik, all the way up through this area, and I think a little further to the north. So the November 10th intrusion was much longer in length um, we think the November 10th intrusion got closer to the surface. This one, the Met Office said, got as close as 1.2 kilometers where it was the shallowest. And I, if I remember right, the November 10th one got as close as half a kilometer. So it got really close to actually uh, penetrating the surface and forming a full-fledged eruption. Um, the November 10th event also involved a lot more magma. Basically, if you think of like the lid coming off the system and magma squirting into the subsurface, a lot more magma moved from the power plant area over into this zone on November 10th. And that's why we had to wait, remember, so we had November 10th, which was an intrusion event, but then we had to wait nearly a whole month beyond that to get the next eruptive event. March 2nd was small, and here we are a week later looking at a very likely eruptive event uh, any day now, possibly, um, you know, today, potentially, right? In the next few days would be a very educate, a good educated guess. So uh, let's see other differences. Other differences, I suppose, were the November 10th event was the initial event that the magma found pathways into this region, but also widened them and significantly altered 
the fracture system in the rocks. That's why they had so many earthquakes and why Grindavik was evacuated on that day um, was the earthquakes were just much higher in magnitude and many more earthquakes. This March 2nd event happened with way fewer. I don't know what the total number would be. I wouldn't be surprised if November 10th had, I don't know, thousands of earthquakes, maybe as many as 5,000 total earthquakes, whereas March 2nd maybe was only a couple hundred earthquakes. So very different events, even though they resulted in fundamentally the same thing, uh, a magma intrusion along a northeast southwest trend. Um, there's some really big differences there, but that's a great question and a really good uh, comparison to make. So thank you. Uh, William Williams, could the warming of the surrounding rocks by the ongoing eruptions make the rock more pliable instead of brittle, resulting in less earthquakes? Um, maybe around the magma body, but probably not the ongoing eruptions, like the, the active lava flows that are at this, well not active, but the lava flows at the surface, those lava fields, even though they're still degassing and cooling, um, their effect on the underlying rocks is quite minimal. Um, so you could probably j just get underneath those. If you have like a hot lava flow here that's hot from a month ago, right? Still cooling off and the rocks underneath it, I bet by the time you're half a meter below that, there's no appreciable heat signature. I don't know, maybe it's a little further than that, maybe a meter, but still the point is it's not really heating it up. But over at the magma reservoir or the magma sill or magma body, whatever we want to call it, um, that is that you've got freshly injected magma that's coming up into the system as it accumulates more volume it's got to spread out it's got to pressurize and so it's probably making the rocks a little bit more pliable as you say or what we might call elastic uh, they're able to deform and bend but at some point these rocks do behave somewhat brittly in this case and they do break and generate earthquakes uh, Liz Schmidt would you consider teaching pre-taped online geology classes. Would your community college allow non-students to pay for the course? Um, I do have two geology classes that I run each semester that are online. One is natural disasters and the other one is geology of national parks. They do have like recorded lectures just like this. Uh, they're not interactive. There's, they're not live streams, obviously. Uh, but I still am there monitoring like the class, there's announcements, you know, you can get a hold of me. And I do have one viewer, I think she's, I can't remember her name right now. She's in my class, I should know. Oh, her name's Lynn. And she, I think, is located in upstate New York. And she is taking a class from the College of Southern Idaho, where I teach, um, as an online student, even though she's located remotely. And I think she's had a very good experience. Um, but you could, maybe she's on there right now, I don't know. Maybe she could speak to that. Um, so I guess I'm already doing that, right? So I have two classes a semester that are um, exactly what you're saying there. And you don't have to, anyone can be a student. So here's the, here's the, if, if you don't know this, here's, here's the big reveal for the day. At least in the U.S. this is true. I don't know about other countries, but you can go to your local community college or university to some degree. Anyone can be a student. So your window of being a student is, doesn't end when you turn 26 or whatever. Um, anyone can go back as an older person, as a senior, as a retiree, or someone, you know, whatever, at whatever point you're in your life, and sign up for a class at your local higher education institute uh, and, and go. You don't have to be on a degree-seeking program. I have a gentleman in my physical geology class right now who just retired this past year. I guess he's in his late 60s. I didn't ask. Um, but he loves it. He shows up every day. He's working with some of the younger students and he wants to learn geology, how the earth works and rocks and minerals. Um, his name's Dwayne. He loves it. I've had one semester in the last couple of years, I had a 91 year old retired Air Force colonel. Great student. He, he just soaked it up. Um, you know, it's you don't have to take the test if you don't want to. You can audit the class. Um, but some of these older people that have taken my classes have, they're like, hey, no, I want to learn and I want to take the tests and hold myself accountable. Uh, I had an 86-year-old woman one semester that took my class. So, um, so there you go. I mean, you know, if you didn't know that before, hear it now and consider this, that you can go 
you should be able to, unless there's something I'm missing. This is certainly true at our school. Anyone can take a class. Um, it doesn't have to be a community ed class. It can be a regular four credit course in anything you want to learn, whether it's geology or history or English or math or language, whatever you want to learn. Um, you still pay for the class, so you pay the tuition, and then you can either audit the class, uh, which means you take it without getting a grade, or you can choose to take it for a grade. So either way. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps, but I'm a big proponent of obviously geology education, and this is one way to do it. YouTube is sort of informal geology education. Uh, and then going down this other route with classes and such would be a little bit more of a formal route. So, uh, okay, there's question sheet one. Let's go to question sheet two. And then um, we might do a third one. I don't know. We'll just have to see. So, Amanda, Joe, if you can just kind of be on standby. Go ahead and maybe put together a third sheet of questions and we'll see if we get to it. Oh my gosh, from Nick Zentner. This is exciting. Uh, is this trans tension regime a, a recent discovery? Why is it important? Well, thanks, Nick, for your question. In Iceland, I don't think it's a recent discovery. Um, it's just something in reading that paper, I just became very aware that I hadn't done a good job of educating or sharing, I suppose, with my viewers that, that was an, that's an important part of, of the Reykjanes Peninsula story is that it's not a purely what we call orthogonal you know, spreading perpendicular to the plate boundary type of setting. Everything's kind of tilted on its side. The spreading direction is oblique to the trend of these fracture systems. So it's it's it happens in other places. Um, there's certain parts of like the San Andreas system that has trans tension. Uh, I just did some videos down in the Salton Trough at the southern end, south of the San Andreas Fault in Southern California. And there's parts of that that are trans tensional systems. Um, I think it's important though, and maybe we could go back to some sort of graphic here. I think it's important because um, it allows us to know how the, the, the motion of the plates and the strain is being partitioned. That it's not as, there's three things going, there's at least three things going on here. You have maybe more than that. Forget, forget I just dropped a number there. There's the plate motion shown with the big yellow arrows. That is the dominant stress force that's acting on the rocks. Then you have going with that different orientations of faults that are accommodating that stress. And this, I suppose, ties back into uh, this fun graphic. No, not that one. This one right here. Where'd it go? There we go. Um, where we see different things happening. So along, so when you have this type of stress regime, and we don't need to explain the fancy diagrams, just know that the rocks um, are doing this kind of thing in response to the tectonic stresses. So we're getting the strain or the way the rocks are deforming partitioned or separated. I don't know why we use all these fancy words. It's called strain partitioning, but really it just means the rocks are deforming along different trends and in different ways. So we're getting two sets of strike slip faults, which are accommodating the plate tectonic stress. We're also getting sets of fractures that are opening up northeast, southwest. And those then are the primary conduits for the volcanoes and the magma supplies. So you see these trends across the landscape on the Reykjanes Peninsula because the northeast southwest trend of these opening fractures is being manifested by the plate tectonic motion. So I found it, I think it's important because it tells us what kind of earthquakes to expect. North south strike slip faults, kind of east west ish, or I guess west southwest, east northeast directed strike slip faults. There's also some normal faults. There's just all types of structures on the Reykjanes Peninsula. There's fissures that erupted, there's fissures like over here. Let me just show you a couple real quick. So we obviously have fissures that erupted lava, like Elvarp. We have other fissure systems that did not erupt lava. So like these ones over here uh, at the west end of the system. 
Um, so we have non-eruptive and eruptive fissures, which are just fractures with openings to them. Then we have strike slip faults, faults that are sliding back and forth. And then we have normal faults where one side's going up and one side's going down. And so there's lots of different structures that are accommodating the, the three ring circus is, that is this plate boundary. Um, the hotspot doesn't matter as much when it comes to the structures because the hotspot's just supplying magma more magma than we might get just from the, the plate boundary itself. So this area has higher than normal amounts of magmatic activity because of the hotspot hot spot contribution. But in terms of the orientations, that's totally dictated uh, by these faults. So um, hopefully I made you proud there, Nick. I tried really hard, but it's fascinating to me. It, it's cool as a structural geologist. It's, it's something I get excited about. Um, Ellen Borg, is there somewhere to learn or can it be explained how to understand what the GPS graphs are telling us? Total noob here watching your video streams for a couple weeks trying to catch up. No problem. So um, thanks for asking, first of all. That's the most important thing is when you don't know something, you just raise your hand and ask. Um, I was in my workout class the other day and or my yoga class and they said we were going to explore the psoas muscle in our yoga class. And I kind of looked around and everyone was nodding their heads. And I raised my hand in the back of the room and said, I am 51 years old and I've never heard of that muscle. Can you please explain? So I get you. Okay, so in our GPS graphs, so this is a specific station. This is the Svart Sengi station, which is located close to the power plant. Uh, you can see up here the last data point was today, March 9th, uh, between midnight and 8 a.m. Uh, and then I think the last... I'm not sure. Then the last day, last run was around 10, 10. Anyway, so we have three graphs here. These graphs give us three dimensional motion. So the first graph is showing us how the station attached to the ground moved in a north south direction. So no, notice that it says north and there's positive and negative values. Okay, well, let's start here because that's where this thing started, right? Wherever we're at. Okay, notice on the December 18th eruptive event, the station moved up, which is north. Then on the January 14th eruptive event, it also moved up. Then it was moving slightly up, right? Just a little bit. Then it moved actually down a little bit, just a smidge on February 8th. So basically the dots show us the location of the GPS station with respect to north and south and whatever baseline they kind of start with. Over long-term trends, December, January, February, March, we can see uh, movement of that GPS station in that north-south direction. If you go to the middle graph with the green dots, this just shows you how the station moved with respect to the east-west component of motion. So a positive value above zero is an eastward motion and a negative value is westward motion. So here's where we were in early to mid early December. December 18th eruption moved the station to the west then it didn't move at all, right? So it looks like east-west wise, this station really isn't moving at all until there's eruptive events that shove the station in this case to the west. So you can see the sort of stair step down dropping movement and it's moved, you know, 320 to 320. So it's moved over 640 millimeters, 64 centimeters, uh, however many inches that is over that period of time. And then the last plot, so north-south movement, east-west, that's two dimensions of motion. And then the last one will show you vertical motion up and down. So this shows with each red dot how, where the station's elevation was at that particular time. And I think they do this in eight hour sweeps. Um, so you can see the station moving upward over time. A couple anomalous high ones there that may or may not be real. Then it drops because some of the, mag you know, so this is what it's showing, right? The, the GPS data is what it is. And then there's the interpretation, which is our spin on what's happening. So when we talk about inflation deflation of the magma, that's what we are seeing with these trends. When the, when the trend is upward and we're right above or near the magma body, we interpret these upward motions to be inflation of the magma chamber like a balloon. So everything's rising like bread dough, if you want to think of it that way, uh, when you're baking bread. Uh, and then when it drops, that's an eruptive event because some of the magma has left the system, erupted to the surface, and then you drop down to some new starting point and then you start the process again uh, of inflation. So uh, I hope that was a good um, 
explanation Ellen Borg. So never a dumb question here, and we're all we're all noobs at something or other, right? We're all learning, so no worries. Nigel Roberts, at what pressure will gas bubbles start to form in magma known? Well, the gas the gas in the magma at depth is dissolved, so there's so much pressure on the magma that the gases can't expand um, until they get closer to the surface typically, or until there's so much gas pressure that it causes them to come out of solution and actually form bubbles. And, and the analogy here is like, you know, opening your soda a pop bottle. Um, you know, when you open that, you reduce the pressure and then the gases can form in the liquid and actually rise to the surface. So um, the gases are driving the eruption. So right now we know we have a system that is filled pretty much all the space that's available with magma. At what point will that magma erupt? Well, it's continuing to accumulate magma. That magma that's rising and influxing into the system also has dissolved gases. And so it's the volume of magma and its gases that provides the volume and can push this system to its limit in terms of pressure. Um, and in terms of like what pr you ask what pressure though, I think it depends on at what depth you're looking at. I don't have like a number in my head. It also depends on the viscosity of the magma. Some magmas are very runny and more fluid. So gases can uh, come out of solution and form much easier. If it's a very sticky, pasty, silica rich, viscous magma like we see in like Mount St. Helens or the Cascades or underneath Yellowstone perhaps, then it takes a lot more gas to a concentrated gas to actually form bubbles because the, the pressure and the viscosity of the magma is so great. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Patty, is there a chance that the people could live in their town again without the Swiss cheese under their houses and streets? Greetings from Vienna. Oh good, well I'll be in your town here in a couple weeks. Um, I assume you're talking about uh, Grindavik and it's a town that is really it's pretty challenged right now. I didn't mention, but Amanda Joe said the buyout is continuing to go forward. So residents who wish to have, I think, till the end of this year to decide if they want the government to buy out their property. I think it was agreed that it's like 95% of the fire sale value or something like that. Um, but even for those that choose to stay for whatever reason, and we don't want to put any judgment on it one way or another, it, it's going to be tough sledding in Grindavik. You've already got a lot of damage to infrastructure, a lot of which they've taken care of. Um, but with each round of magma intrusions, volcanic eruptions, and or earthquakes, um, it's going to make it very difficult. But that being said, I think I think a lot of people are thinking about like, you know, it, it, it's not a black and white issue of abandon the town and just let nature take its course versus try to keep the town at its original vibrancy, I suppose, and keep everyone there. There might be a middle ground where, I mean, the fishing harbor and port is like the most important thing in this town. Uh, it's one of the few, if not only places on the south coast where ships can come in and out of a harbor that's protected from the the strong waves and surf action on the, in the North Atlantic. So for the foreseeable future, can we keep that industry going so maybe it's a maybe it's a situation where not a lot of people live and sleep in Grindavik, but there are businesses and industry that is still going on there and there's there's reasons for the town to still exist it's just going to maybe have to be well it is it's going to have to be a very different version of itself it's going to have to reinvent itself over its past which is very difficult because it has such a uh an interesting and wonderful past and hopefully when we talk to uh Amanda Joe and Gilfi, we can get some insights there. Anita Paulson, do I remember you saying all rocks on Earth formed from magma, from different kinds of magma, some formed under pressure and others, other ways taking millions of years. Um, I mean, you can kind of spin. So not all rocks come from magma. You have rocks like, uh, like limestones that come from organisms. Um, but all the original rocks on Earth, if you go back to Earth's early history, billions of years ago, they did all form from magma. We had a, a, a lava ocean surrounding the planet based on everything we know. Um, it was basaltic. The continents had yet to take shape. Uh, it was very hot atmosphere. It was totally different environment than what we know. Water didn't exist for the few, first few hundred million years on earth, we think. There's a lot we don't know about that time period. So there's plenty of rocks that 
don't form from magma originally, but many rocks do start out as magma and then cool and crystallize under the surface to form granites or other intrusive rocks. Some erupt from volcanoes and form a variety of volcanic rocks. There are different types of magma. There's silica rich and silica poor and everything in between. Uh, rocks that form under pressure with heat, those are what we call the metamorphic rocks. Uh, some rocks can form very quickly within literally a day and others take much longer periods of time to actually turn into a, an actual rock. So that's just a little uh, a little short explanation there, but hopefully that was helpful. Daniel Takusis, is the magma chamber below the Blue Lagoon becoming shallower due to the lava melting the top of the chamber? I don't think we have any evidence of that. Remember too that the Blue Lagoon and the hot springs there and the power plant are operating. We haven't even seen any notable effects in that geothermal system that lies about two kilometers below the surface. So if the magma chamber was melting the roof of its, I see what you're saying there, it's like melting the roof of the magma chamber or, or body upwards towards the surface. Maybe it's done that a little bit by, you know, a few meters or tens of meters, but not kilometers, right? It hasn't even changed the temperature of the geothermal system at the power plant in the Blue Lagoon. Uh, from Creamers, turn on light, there you go. Is it possible that since this eruption is taking long to occur, it could be a larger event? I don't think so. I think um, the rate of magma influx seems to be pretty constant. Um, it's likely that these pathways the magma has to go through, the, the fracture systems aren't very well connected. It depends on which direction it goes. Um, and I think Professor Thorderson's analogy is a good one, that you've got this magma body, um, and when you get to a certain pressure, you can, you can lift the lid, you can reach a pressure that allows some of the magma to leak out. So I would expect right now we're going to get something similar to the last one or two, maybe th even three eruptions. Um, more likely, this looks like the February eruption, which was shorter duration than something like the December eruption, which was a little bit bigger. So... Um, so I think the system, we, we had some of the magma leak out last Saturday and that kind of like delayed this eruption from occurring sooner than it might have. And we might see this current event be some little magma intrusion, magma leaking out into the subsurface, no eruption, and then we have to wait even longer to get to the next eruptive event. But it doesn't mean that it's larger because each event, whether it's an intrusion or an extrusion, an eruption, is resulting in magma moving into new space that it didn't occupy previously. Keith Dowsett, if there is unerupted magma in the corridors under Sunukur from November and March, at depths below two and five kilometers, would it still be molten? How quickly would it solidify if not erupted to the surface? So remember magma's on this spectrum, right? So it's hot molten magma that's mostly essentially liquid with maybe gas and a little bit of crystals in it. And at the other end of the spectrum, I suppose could be like solid rock. But in the between, there's something called like, we call it crystal mush, which is not a very technical, sexy term, but it works. Um, and it's more viscous, right? So if you go from the most molten runny magma and now imagine it cooling off, crystallizing, right? So more crystals in that magma are going to impede and slow down its motion. So the more crystals are in that magma as it cools, the more viscous it becomes. It doesn't move as quickly or, or, or fast as it might otherwise. A good analogy is like honey. Um, so if there is uninterrupted magma, would it still be molten? I mean, technically, yes, I think that stuff that's down there is still, would still be considered magma, but is it eruptible magma? Is it low viscosity magma? That's debatable. Rock's a good insulator, but I think a lot of these, when the magma's moving from the reservoir off to the east into these places we're seeing it erupting where the dike is, um, it's probably in fairly narrow zones, like only half a meter, a meter, maybe two meters at the most. Uh, and so it's up against ambient temperature rocks. We're still five kilometers down, but still that that's drawing some of the heat out of it and it's still cooling. So I wouldn't say it's solidified yet, but I wouldn't say it's completely molten at this point, but it's all up to modeling and somewhat conjecture, I suppose. Helen Mamwell, do the intrusions go into existing fractures 
previous intrusion corridors, or do they make an additional fracture in the rack, or both scenarios possible? Yeah, both scenarios. So the magma is going to move through and find whatever pathways that are existing. Um, the pressure, so as it finds those existing pathways, it's going to exploit those. If it can, if it has the pressure to widen those, it will. That will generate earthquakes and seismic activity. Um, but the magma just pushing on a face of rock isn't going to do anything, right? We need to have some weakness, some discontinuity. It might be vertical fractures. It might be um, breaks in the layering and all these maybe lava flows, right? So maybe there's a, a rubbly later or layer or something more permeable horizontally that the magma can intrude. So both scenarios possibly there. Susan M., uh, the shallow quakes from earlier today seem close to the surface, subsurface magma body. Could they be caused by stress transferred by the refilling process? Um, it could be. Um, sorry, I had to read the question again. So the question here is, yeah, let's go to the, they are pretty close. They're in, they're in an interesting area. Um, so those earthquakes today down in this area, but just kind of random locations and the weather's kind of crappy. So I just don't know what to do with this seismic data. Am I only seeing 30% of the data because of the crappy weather? Or maybe we're seeing more around grind? Are these actual seismometer seismometers in locations that are kind of protected from the wind? And so we're seeing more data here than up on the ridge lines where it's windier. Like all these things kind of pop into my mind. Um, but your original question about the, could they be caused by stress transfer? Yeah, sure. So we could just be seeing um, magma accumulating in here in the subsurface magma reservoir and an outward stress, compressive stress exerted on the surrounding rocks. Um, you know, you'd expect to see it. You might ask yourself, well, okay, if the magma body's here, how come we're not seeing any earthquakes out here? And I think the answer to that is these rocks are already fractured. These rocks are already beat up. We already have cracks in the ground in Grindavik. These rocks are weak. And so it takes less stress to trigger earthquakes here than it does out here where the rocks are at least right now behaving much more competently. They're more robust. Um, we're just not seeing earthquakes out there. Um, so this is why I wonder, I wonder why these Icelandic geologists keep coming back to this crater over here these craters at Elvorp when there's just no we haven't even seen any earthquakes there we haven't even seen anything that suggests there's pathways or weak spots for the magma to exploit and yet since November we've seen this area just get cracked and broken apart and so it seems like this is going to be the preferred pathway I think moving forward for some time good question um last center would an increase, and I think we'll end after this one here, team. I know, I think Mandy, Amanda Joe sent me a third one. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Let's, uh, where are we at? 1130. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe we can get to a couple of them. Um, would an increased density of GPS and or seismic earth stations in the Reykjanes provide any practical advantage to our knowledge of the state of the magma system? Again, I'm no geophysicist. This is not my expertise. So take this with a very large tasty grain of salt um, more data is always better than fewer but I think they've got a pretty decent array of stations there that seem to in this fa fairly small area um, to figure out the magma system and the, I think you need to do some gravity measurements and there's probably some other geophysical tools that would actually help us figure out the size shape geometry of the magma body and I'm sure the Met Office is considering those um, yeah good question sorry I can't give you more on that Bob Filmar are there any new technologies such as ground penetrating radar gravity mapping that could reveal the underground path magmas in more detail yeah good question I don't know about for the magma reservoir I would say probably there's some other geophysical tools that would be helpful there in terms of the actual pathways the magma is taking through the rocks I don't know because they're so narrow. First of all, it's five kilometers down. I think that's too deep based on what I know about ground penetrating radar. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
gravity. I just don't think your your resolution is going to be tight enough to be able to discern meter wide magma dike pathways. Um, but I don't know. That's a good question. Susan Weimer, are the ridges indicative of the strikes that faults in the Mid Atlantic Ridge as it exists underwater? Are the ridges? Um, well, if you go out into the ocean in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you can see uh, it gets messy. It's always so messy. Um, okay, so here's here's a well-behaved one way out here. So here's what I would call the divergent boundary here. Then there's this big transform or strike slip system here. And then the next part of the divergent boundary picks up over here. I could be way off there. Um, but that would be how I interpret that. And then there's, there's two prominent transform boundaries here. One that's offsetting this divergent boundary, another one here. Um, and then it kind of turns corners here. I'm sure there's better maps that have been made of this and Google Earth maybe isn't the best. Yeah, I can't, I can't make it out here. It's just kind of messy and noisy. I don't know. I mean, obviously the data, you, there's some differences in resolution too, right? Like this is all blurry. But here I've got like a nice sharp contrast. Um, yeah, so it's hard to make out some of those transform boundaries out there in the deeper parts of the ocean. Then we kind of get up on this shelf, this you might call it a continental shelf or just a shelf that goes into Iceland and harder to see them through here as well. So tricky question. All right, team, I'm going to do it. Let's do sheet three. I'm going to we're try to wrap this up in about 15 minutes or less. Geology nut 37. If magma doesn't enter via the strike of bulbs, where does it enter from? Um, it has to enter where it has. I'm not saying it can't enter at a strike slip fault, but the very motion of a strike slip fault in terms of shear stress is not a good pathway because you might be pulverizing the rocks and weakening them, and maybe that's a pathway, but there's still com some compressive stress there. Uh, the divergent normal, the divergent boundaries are the normal faults where ex we're extending and pulling the rocks apart. That's going to create a wider opening in general, all things being equal. JSEL657. Oh, that was, is that the same question? If the strike slip faults don't provide a pathway for the magma, why were there eruptions there and longer than the ones now? Well, there's other types of faults there. The north-south ones are the dominant, uh, going back to that paper, I suppose, are the dominant fault type. But there are normal faults there, and there are other types of faults, and there's open fractures as well. Um, and longer than the ones now. We, why the eruptions were longer is a good question. Um, could be there was a bigger magma reservoir. I've, I'm sure there's some papers that have explained this in more detail. Just I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, because you had the one eruption in 2021 that lasted six months. Um, but it didn't put out a very big volume. So it was just kind of erupting from a small area. So if you're erupting X amount of magma from a small conduit, it's going to last longer than if you're ripping a four kilometer section of the Earth's crust and pumping out a tremendous amount of magma like we did with the December eruption. Susan, I can make this a little bigger for you. Susan Catalo, besides wind buffeting seismometers, how else does extreme weather compromise data coming in? Uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of that either. Um, I think the wind, I have heard with the, the DAS data, which is the, um, the fiber, optic, fiber optic cable, that they have in uh, just to the west of Grindavik that when the waves crash in, when the, the sea's really kind of strong and the waves crash into that south coastline, that actually disrupts the data as well. So there's a couple instances there. Um, Dan wants to know what classes I'm teaching this semester. Oh, good, an easy question. <laughs> and one I can answer completely. I have a pretty full load this semester, team. Uh, so I was on sabbatical last semester, and this semester... I well part of it's you know part of it was self-inflicted but I have um, a climbing class that just ended so that one's off my plate I had six classes but now I'm down to five I have a physical geology class um, that meets four days a week at nine o'clock I have a historical geology class geology 102 that looks at the history of the earth fossils uh, plate motions um, all sorts of cool things that class meets at 11s, that's four days a week. 
And then I have two online classes, a natural disasters class, geology of national parks class. And then my other class, good segue, is a field geology class where we're going to Iceland. So these students are learning about Iceland through the semester. It just kind of got started. It's a late start class. Uh, we'll start meeting here in a week or two regularly each week to learn about Iceland. They'll do projects and presentations on the geology of Iceland. They'll learn about how glaciers and volcanoes interact, some of the stuff you guys have all learned. I actually have an assignment where they're going to track for a week or two all the monitoring and eruptive data and um, kind of digest and summarize that. And then that class will culminate in a trip to Iceland in mid-May. Um, and hopefully we'll all be able to meet with Amanda Joe and all those good things. So great opportunity for the students. So, so that's my class for my teaching load for this semester. Thanks, Dan. Do you think an eruption is likely just west of Grindavik? Um, no, I don't think an eruption just west of Grindavik here, out here. Um, I don't think it's likely. Is it possible? Yes. Um, but I think we're most likely to see something where we've seen the last three eruptions. That's going to be the most likely outcome, I would guess. Uh, Kim Kaufman, do you have to pay an enrollment fee and test into the college first? Is there testing required? No. As far as I know, there's not. You just, it's, especially at community colleges. Um, I don't know if the universities are a little bit different, but here at the community college, you, you fill out some paperwork with your your contact info and such and you pay like maybe like a, a small fee to process that paperwork and then you're a student and then you can sign up for classes uh, our college even has i won't have all the details right here i should but we have a thing where if you're over a certain age you get to take classes for free um, you can get on the website and look and see what the details are there but that's something that exists at our college but i don't know how it works everywhere else. Thanks, Kim. Shauna Guthrie, how do earthquakes occur in the middle of a tectonic plate? Oh, that's a good question. And we could go to uh, something like this and maybe answer that. So let's look at earthquakes for today. Well, <laughs> here's an earthquake happening in the middle of a tectonic plate, but that's Hawaii and that's a hot spot, and that's probably. Uh, not being totally, but here's a better one. So here's, uh, well, that one's maybe not the best one either, China. Let's find, let's go back a few, let's go back a week and get some more earthquakes on here. There we go. Okay, so let's find literally a, a, a earthquake in the middle of a plate. Well, it looks like, oh, here's one, Australia. There you go, they had a 3.5 in Bulabura, Australia. 8.4 kilometers, and this happened on yesterday, March 8th. So we can get earthquakes distant from tectonic plate boundaries. Note, uh, it's obvious that most of the quakes are happening on or very close to the tectonic plates. I think everyone can see that. That's where the lion's share of earthquake activity occurs. But we can get earthquakes in other places distant from plate boundaries, uh, dominantly by just reactivating older structures. So even though Australia as a continent is not near a plate boundary and is very stable geologically. It does have old faults from its old history of banging into other continents and other sorts of things. And so you can, Australia as a continent is moving to the north uh, away from this divergent boundary and it's starting to collide here with Southeast Asia. And so as the whole continent drifts north slowly, the stress, the stress can get released in that plate by just reactivating some of these older faults. So you can get these other anomalous areas producing earthquakes. They generally aren't big. 3.5 is pretty small, but people apparently did feel it. It was shallow, but it wasn't It wasn't a damaging earthquake. Notice it was pretty much a one-off. I don't even see, it wasn't even anything else there. There probably were aftershocks, but this was the only one we detected with our American seismic network. Undoubtedly, the, the Australians recorded aftershocks with that. But to fundamentally answer your question succinctly, um, that's the idea, is you can reactivate old faults within a continent away from a tectonic plate boundary um, just by having the whole plate being in motion and under stress. How come eruptions from T-heading, how come eruptions never take place exactly the same place? Could be a lot of reasons. Some, some places do, but these eruptions here in Iceland, at least the last ones we've been seeing, 
have been in slightly different locations, possibly because the previous eruptions plugged up some of the magma or pl plugged up some of the conduits that the magma now occupies. And so it needs to look for some other place to break out and produce an eruption. Um, and so, you know, you might look at this map and be like, hey, you know, maybe we need to fill in this part of the fracture system. And that's a very good hypothesis for where we might see uh, another eruptive event. Or it might be something, you know, parallel to one of these events. We actually kind of saw that here a little bit. The, the red is the February eruption. And notice that it was pretty close to, and in some places overlapped, the December eruptive events there. And then finally, because my throat's starting to go a little dry from E. Lindborg, might not get into this follow-up, but regarding the GPS graphs, would love to hear more how that data gets interpreted north, south, east, west, the station moves, but what does it imply regarding magma? Yeah, I think we kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, when stations are moving all away from each other, um, kind of like bread crust rising in the oven that indicates inflation and magma that's migrating and pushing the stations out so you do have to look at it in aggregate you have to look at multiple stations see what the trends are over time and then just interpret it right if it's whether it's magma movement in this case or it could be faulting that's causing up down east west north south motion uh, all that stuff has to be considered so good stuff um we did it. We did three three pages of questions, and it was pretty fun for the most part. So uh, last look here at the live chat, and let me just double check and make sure there's nothing else coming through my email from any of my moderators or anything. Let's see. Um, yeah, it looks like everything there looks okay. So. Awesome. So yeah, it's a really nice day here in Idaho. And even though I've enjoyed spending time with you good folks here, I am going to head out and take some friends rock climbing today, this afternoon with the sun out. So thanks as always for joining me here on this live stream. We can do one last look to make sure it's not erupting as we speak. Nope. But this would be the place to see it on live from Iceland, one of their webcams potentially. Um, also probably keeping an eye on the earthquakes, uh, but also maybe looking at the weather forecast and, and kind of taking a measured approach to that as well. So, but that was good stuff, team. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks as always for all your support. Give the, the channel thumbs up. That's great. Share it with folks. Let people know that there's this great community of uh, like-minded geology learners, just people who enjoy learning. And we have this active case study here in Iceland where we're able to not just learn, but then apply what we've learned, learn from the data we're looking at. It's just a great uh, opportunity. And I feel very humbled and privileged uh, sort of as the coach of the team, if you will, in kind of guiding things along. But I enjoy learning from you. I enjoy learning from the papers we read and the data we analyze. You guys are doing great. And so we'll just see how things go moving forward. The schedule for the week, what I got going on this week? Uh, just classes. Um, I'll probably put another update out um, sometime midweek. Obviously, if there's something significant, I'll try to jump on as quick as I can. And then I'll record that interview this Friday with Ariana Soldati, the volcanologist from North Carolina State University. So you guys can look for that and hopefully enjoy that. Then next weekend, we might do something else. I'll try to get at least one more live stream in before I leave on my vacation on the 20th though. So we'll probably do something mm, maybe next Saturday, maybe Sunday morning. We'll just have to see uh, moving forward. But thanks to our great moderators, Susan Helmer, Amanda Joe, who goes by Mandy Joe on the chat and Lisa R. Thanks for keeping the live chat going. Have a great day team. Keep checking on Iceland, keep learning, keep growing, and enjoy. Take care. We'll see you later.